good to be together in God's house, and great to see your smiling faces. I have a couple of announcements to add to what is in the bulletin and what's been scrolling on the screen. Uh, there is an announcement that has been scrolling um, about Carol Warren's service, but we are grieving as a church family in the midst of the news of Carol Warren's um, sudden and somewhat unexpected um, passing this week. And um, her service will be here in the sanctuary tomorrow morning. Uh, you're welcome to come to the open visitation from 10 to 11. Uh, stay for the funeral service at 11. Uh, Brother David and I will be officiating that service together. And then um, there will be a grave site to follow out at Woodland Cemetery. Another announcement or an update. I think it was last week I told you guys about Miss Vera Knowles, her son, who is in the really bad wreck in uh, Lamar. He's making some progress, but has a long, long way to go. Um, a lot of blood, uh, brain trauma. And so if you would continue to remember the Knowles family in your prayers. Be aware, I'm sure you all are, that it is really hot today. And going to be really hot this week. And so uh, check on your neighbors, check on the... Um, the people and the pets that are at risk, be sure to keep your mind on that. And then one other just quick reminder, you have an insert in your bulletin about the status of our church finances. Mr. John Frost is going to speak to that um, shortly. But just to let you know, we're having a meeting, so we would love for all of you to stay. If you can, we're going to try to keep it short after worship. Uh, we'll say our goodbyes and, and let whoever needs to leave, leave. But if you would like to stay to get more information on that, um, so that the most of us that are possible can be in the know about what's happening with our church finances. We would appreciate you staying. That would be immediately following worship. Any other announcements? If not, I would invite you to prepare your hearts for worship as the light of Christ enters the sanctuary. Mm -hmm.
that you want to join or that you need to talk with me or that you have a special prayer request or um, if we don't have your information or if you have any updated information, phone, email, whatever, let us know. Uh, that's a good way to communicate with the office. Let us stand together for our Trinity Sunday call to worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, glory to you forever. Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, glory to you forever. Fount of blessing, living water, and mighty power, glory and praise to you forever. God triune, three in one, and yours forever. Forever, let us worship you. We are yours forever. Received a gift from the mustard seed 
uh, early in the year of $8,000 to support our children's ministries, and it was designated for, for salary support for the position uh, that worked, the director of ministry that works with the children's ministries. The total gift was $8,000, but today uh, of that, we we put uh, approximately $3,333.30 into the operating budget account uh, to be spent for salary support. But our, our total expenditures uh, through the year at the end of May have been $153,049.26. Now, we're right at where we were budgeted in terms of expenditures, but you can see that our, our giving has not uh, kept up with that. And you think, well, where'd that difference come from? Well, uh, fortunately, we've had uh, in an uh, account, there's two accounts for several years, that we call our budget, budget reserve accounts. They're special accounts that are used for cash flow management. Uh, so we've transferred from those accounts from the beginning of this year, a total of $17,200 to offset that deficit. And also, at the beginning of the year, uh, we had a, a beginning balance that we transferred over from last year to our checking account. And of that, we've, we've expended $11,436.40 to cover that, that deficit. So the total deficit through the end of May was $28,636.40 that we covered from those two sources. And you can see that uh, if we look at uh, the, the difference there is about $542 that we've got. So we spent approximately $30,000 to date that we haven't uh, replaced or have, that has not come in. Uh, we did have enough reserve and the beginning of the year checking account to cover that. Uh, but the, the, the stressor is that we cannot continue at that rate uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, what we have remaining in, currently in our budget reserve account at the end of May was $33,532.32. If we project that to the end of the year, uh, that would result in us having spent approximately $4,000 that we don't have in reserve or that we at, to date have not received any gifts and projecting that forward down at this stage. Um, and the, the other issue with that is not only would we come up short like that, but we wouldn't have that large reserve to begin with, to begin the year with, to help cover the ebbs and flows of, of our cash management. Uh, so what, traditionally what we've been able to do in years past is we've expended money during low times, and then when revenue came in, we replenished those reserve accounts uh, so that we could continue using that for cash management. But to this point this year, we haven't been able to replenish those so I just wanted to, to bring that to your attention. Uh, and I also want to uh, be sure and thank the Mustard Seeds for their support. Over the past three years, they've supported Vacation Bible School uh, with gifts. Uh, they supported Kids Club with gifts. And like I said, this year, they provided that $8,000 gift uh, to support the, the position uh, of our children's ministry. Right? So I, I do want to thank them. And I do want to remind folks they're always looking for volunteers, and, and you can do a, a wide variety of different things to help them out. And you can contact Brenda or Martha, or there are several other people here. I want you to raise your hand if you are involved with Mustard Seed or have ever volunteered. So look around the room and you'll see folks you can talk to and ask about what they need done and how you can help them. But I do want to encourage that. And they have a large outreach to the community that's way beyond what they do just to support us because they're main outreach to the local community, but I do want to thank them. After the service, we will have discussion, questions, try to provide some answers. There is some additional information that's a lot more detailed that's back in the narthex that we'll collect and hand out for our discussion panel. And I would encourage you to stay and talk about that, but think about, we need money to support ministries, so think about if you can come up with different ways of supporting the church, addition to our prayers and our presence and our service. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. John. We appreciate your work. And there are a few new people in the congregation. Just let me say that the uh, mustard seed, if you're unaware, is the thrift shop just next to the church. Um, it's its own entity, but it's associated with our church and the ministry, a part of the ministry of this church, and we're so grateful. They do such good work. Um, 
providing things for the community, but also providing scholarships and grants and all sorts of things. They do great work. We appreciate their work. But I invite now the ushers to come forward to receive this morning tithes and offerings.
once in a while you discover a new hymn, even though this hymn was written in um, 2001, 1996 actually, we published in 2001. The words are very current, we hope we do it justice, it's called God of the Bible. Uh, kind of describes some of what we're going through in our world today and maybe some responses to that as well. Bosher's, 
who was the choir director and the organist both at my little church that I grew up in in Clarendon, Arkansas, First Methodist. Um, she allowed me to sing in the choir when I was just a teenager. And Miss Doe, we called her, sat on one side of me, and a lady who was not kin to me, but I always knew her as Aunt Tommy. <laughs> she sat on the left of me, and uh, what a blessed experience that was to be able to use the gift of song in worship. So last Sunday, we celebrated what Sunday? Pentecost. And everything was adorned in red, and I was wearing red, and some of you were wearing red, red which symbolizes the fire, the passion of our Lord, this, uh, not the passion as in the passion, but the passion, the fiery passion of our Lord um, for creation and for God's children. Pentecost, we remember, calls us to think about, contemplate, and give thanks for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit unto God's assembled people and the birth of the church. That was last Sunday. This Sunday, we celebrate Trinity Sunday. And while Trinity Sunday is not as well um, celebrated or as widely celebrated, I should say, uh, as Pentecost Sunday, it is an important Sunday that we need to mark in our worship. Because Trinity Sunday uh, is important for a couple of reasons. One, it marks the end of the Easter season. So now we enter into a phase of time in the Christian calendar called Ordinary Time. You'll see all these pyramids turn to green next week, and they'll remain green well into the fall um, until we come back around to Advent, with a few exceptions. And, um, and so this ends, today marks the end of the Easter season. But it's also an important Sunday to, to mark in our worship because it asks us to honor, to embrace, um, to deeply think about the doctrine of the Trinity. The honor, to honor the triune nature of our God. Trinity Sunday is one Sunday in the Christian calendar that calls upon us to focus our hearts and our minds solely on a Christian doctrine. All these other special Sundays, they really mark an event in the life of God's church. Today calls on us to celebrate a doctrine of the church. Today we honor and celebrate Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit important doctrine in our lives, something that's foundational to Christian belief, something that's hard to explain, hard to understand, hard to grapple with, but nonetheless, uh, we need to think deeply about. And so, um, as we begin this message on Trinity Sunday, let us pray. Most gracious, most holy, triune God, we ask that you would be here with us this morning as we celebrate everything about who you are and how you shepherd and mold us. We ask, Lord, that you would give us the grace to hear your word for us today, that you would challenge us to go deeper in our faith and our understanding of who you are and how you interact with the world you created and how you engage with each of us, your most precious creation. Lord God, as we pray to you today in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, help us, Lord. Help us to understand you more fully, to know you more intensely, and to be moved by you all the more each and every day of our lives. We pray these things in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the children of God said, Amen. 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 Now, Trinity Sunday is a tough Sunday for preachers. <laughs> Dustin will tell you, I worked a good bit of Friday. What, about seven hours Friday? And then I came home and took a break, and then I was up until 6.30 in the morning Saturday trying to complete a Trinity Sunday sermon. Because when you get involved in reading about the Trinity, you can get lost. There's a lot of stuff to read about the Trinity. And I just kept reading and reading and reading, and I hadn't really studied the Trinity in a while as a doctrine and what that means for our lives. And so I just was studying and studying and studying. And then the more you – this is a – trip, a trap that pastors get caught in. The more you study, the more you put in your head, the less you're able to get it to come out of your head into something that makes sense on paper for a message. And so um, it's, a, it's a tough Sunday for preachers because on the one hand, you think, oh, the Trinity, it's so overwhelming. Nobody understands it. Nobody can fully describe it. Let's just not. Let's just pretend this isn't Trinity Sunday. But on the other hand, 
You recognize that this is foundational doctrine. It's the foundation of our core belief. It's our core belief in who God is, and it's how we see and understand God and how we experience God. And so, yes, for sure, we ought to talk about the Trinity. So here we are. It's Trinity Sunday, and today we're going to explore together what we mean when we say that our God is triune. We're going to cover together what some of the characteristics of our triune God are, and we're going to talk about why, honestly, we should love the fact that we serve a God who we understand and perceive as triune. Complicated though it may be, um, how we are called to love and embrace this notion that God is triune. So I want to begin with two questions, and the first one is this. When you hear the word Trinity, what thoughts, ideas, and images come into your mind? And I want you in your, to invite your participation in this. When you hear the word Trinity, what happens in your brain? What fires off? What do you think of? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, yes. What else? It's hard, huh? <laughs> what else? Three aspects of God. Yeah, three in one, right? Yeah. Miss Nyla. I heard you explain water, ice, and smoke. Oh, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The old water metaphor. <laughs> What else comes to your mind? Or images? What symbols do you think of when you think of the Trinity? A clover. A clover. Triangle. Triangle? Yes, very much. I've, I've put up a few uh, images uh, for us. This one on the top, your left, the red, that's called a tri triquetra. If I'm saying that right, it's a Latin word. It's three arcs that are never ending and never beginning. They sort of just continue on forever, um, which signifies the eternal nature of Christ. It's also kind of triangular, and there are three arcs, right, it's representing the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, you'll notice in the bottom right, there's a triquetra with also a circle in the middle because the circle often represents God because it has no ending and no beginning. And then you see there's a symbol often used for the Trinity, three circles intertwined. As Ms. Carroll said, a triangle because it's three points and it's one triangle. We think of three in one, which was mentioned. Um, these are a lot of the images and words and thoughts that come to our mind when we think of the word Trinity. My next question is, what metaphors... <laughs> As Ms. Nyla already opened up for us, what metaphors have you heard that are meant to help us think about the Trinity and understand the Trinity? There's the water one, right? Water is water. It's just water. But water can exist in the form of solid or liquid or gas, right? Okay, what else? What other metaphors? Eggs. Some, huh? Eggs. Eggs, yeah. I don't know that I ever heard this until uh, seminary. I've never heard this one. But there's the shell, there's the yolk, and there's the white. It is one egg, but it has these three parts, right? Any others that you've heard over the years? The shamrock, yes, that's already been mentioned. Why the shamrock? Because it's one clover, right, but it has these three leaves. Um, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yeah. Go to that next slide. So there's the egg, there's the water, there's the shamrock. Here's some more. Uh, I had not heard this one until I studied this week, the apple. Anybody heard that one? You have the skin, you have the flesh of the apple, and you have the core. I don't know what people that use that metaphor do with the seeds, but nonetheless. Uh, <laughs> then I've heard this one, this tree. Now you have God the Father in the roots, God the Son, the, the uh, trunk, and then God the Holy Spirit in the flowering branches. And then this was a really new one in kind of modern. Y'all know what that is on the far left? A fidget spinner, right? <laughs> the kids use these fidget spinners a lot when they need something to do with their hands so that their brains can more um, clearly focus. And, and that was one I came across this week as I was studying the Trinity. We've all no doubt heard lots and lots of these metaphors for the Trinity. And I guess they have their usefulness to some degree. They have their usefulness in trying to help us wrap our feeble, limited human minds around what is the triune nature of God, which is something that is so huge and so hard to understand for us. And I guess they have their purpose, but at some point, all of these metaphors break down. And at seminary, they really break these down for you. They really do not want you to talk about these in terms of explaining or describing in any way the Trinity. Because 
Yes, there's water, and water can be solid, liquid, and gas, but it can't be liquid and gas at the same time, and it can't be solid and liquid at the same time, and God is all things, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all at the same time. Same thing with the egg, the shamrock, all the things. The reality is that none of these metaphors could ever fully explain our God, because the God that we serve is beyond our full comprehension, and that's okay, and in fact, that's the way it should be. Because the reality is that we don't have to fully understand our God, and we're not supposed to fully understand our God. Our limited human language and the limitations of our mind make it so that we're always going to end up frustrated if we're trying to use our language and just this little cantaloupe-sized thing in our skull, right, to explain that which is unexplainable. A spiritual father in the 4th century named Evagrius of Pontus, which is a cool name, Evagrius of Pontus. He said this about trying to explain or describe the Trinity. He said, God cannot be grasped by thought. If God could be grasped, then God would not be God. Which is a nice thought. Similarly, uh, a Syrian monk of the 7th century, John of Damascus, this is a better one, <laughs> it is plain then that there is a God, but what God is in God's essence and nature is absolutely incomprehensible and unknowable. God is infinite. And incomprehensible. And all that is comprehensible about God is God's incomprehensibility. <laughs> That's a great quote. I think John of Damascus liked to hear himself talk. <laughs> Nonetheless, it has um, merit. It's a long and complicated way of saying that we don't need to fully comprehend God. And we couldn't if we wanted to. Rather, we're simply called as God's children to love and adore the Lord our God and to embrace the mystery that is our God. And I love that phrase, embrace the mystery that is our God. I like that because I hope, personally, that I never think I know so much as a finite human being that I think I've got God all figured out. And I hope none of you ever think that either. I like to embrace the mystery that is our God. So the doctrine of the Trinity in a nutshell, God is God, the one true God, and yet at the same time within the divine Godhead, God is Father, God is Son, and God is Holy Spirit. Having said that, the Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Spirit, and the Spirit is not the Son, and the Spirit is not the Father, and all of that, but they are all God. God has one nature. One essence, yet at the same time, within the divine Godhead, there are these three distinct personhoods. The doctrine of the Trinity says to us that God is one, and yet God reveals God's self to us in three distinct ways throughout time. Another important thing that they drill into your head in seminary about the Trinity, uh, a couple more things, that God is co-eternal and co-equal. Um, that is to say, it is not the case. That one of the persons of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, or the Spirit, existed before the other ones. Back in early Christendom, the church fathers had to get together at councils and hammer out exactly what it was we believed about Christ and about God and about the church and the role of the church in the world. And they, they formulated these creeds, right? The Athanasian Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Neo, the Nicene, Constantinopolitan Creed. There's lots of them. And the Apostles' Creed. Right? Lots of creeds that state what we believe and what we don't believe. It was very important to them that they stated that as Christians we do not believe that God existed before the Son and before the Spirit. They would say that is a heretical thought. In fact, we believe that they are co-eternal because they are one. There was never a time when one existed that the other did not. It is also not the case, they'll tell you in seminary, that any one of the persons of the Trinity created any of the other persons of the Trinity. Some Christians early on in Christendom wanted to say that God the Father created God the Son, much like God created humanity. And the Christians got together in these councils and they said, absolutely not. The scripture indicates that Jesus isn't a created being like us. Jesus is the embodiment of the Father. He's the full revelation of the Father in human form, 100% human, 100% divine. Right? He is God. God for a time in the flesh. And so it is not the case that any of the persons of the Trinity created any of the other persons of the Trinity because they are co-equal 
And it is not the case that any persons of the Trinity are above or below or more important or less important than any of the other persons of the Trinity. Because that was another thing back in early Christendom. They wanted to say that the Spirit was somehow a lesser being than God the Father or God the Son. But that is just not true because God is one. The fullness of Godness, the fullness of deity, dwells in each person of the Trinity completely and dwells in the fullness of the Trinity. So why do we believe this? Why do we believe in this triune uh, understanding of God? Well, throughout the word, um, God's word, the word trinity is not found. Although it is clear throughout God's word that there is both a oneness to God and a plurality to God. Though the Bible doesn't explicitly say that God is three in one, it is clear from the opening lines of Genesis all the way to Revelation. Parts of the Old Testament, parts of the New Testament, the letters of Paul, all the way through. It is clear that our God is one being and yet expresses and reveals God's self in three distinct ways. We can find glimpses of a Trinitarian revelation of God throughout the pages of Scripture from the beginning to the end. But nowhere in Scripture is the revelation of God as triune more clear than in Jesus' words on the mountain after his resurrection, when he's gathered all of his disciples up together, he said, meet me at the mountain. And they go to the mountain, and Jesus says to them, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19, which we refer to as the Great Commission. This is the clearest statement about Trinitarian theology that is made, and Jesus makes this statement himself. Now, there are other very notable glimpses that people often refer to when we talk about why we believe God is three persons in one or triune. Uh, notably, in Genesis, when God says, let us make mankind in our image, there's a plurality to God mentioned in Genesis. And in the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan by John the Baptist, we hear God's voice speaking from the heavens. We see, presenting himself in the water, God the Son. And God the Spirit seems to light on Jesus the Son in the form of a dove. And so there's this Trinitarian uh, moment where we get to see all these facets, if you will. And that's not a great word. My seminary professors would fuss at me for that. But all these facets of God. And still yet, this one verse... Uh, the Great Commission is the most clear Trinitarian statement of all the scripture, and Jesus himself said that. He revealed that God is three in one. The word trinity is a compound word. It's a combination of two separate words, tri meaning three, and unity meaning togetherness, or unity, or one. Can we, as finite, limited human beings, ever fully describe God? No. Can we fully understand God with our limited minds? No. But by the gift of faith, we may profess that our belief in this holy mystery, and that is an important thing to do in our Christian walk, to believe that God is triune and to open our lives and our hearts and our minds and our spirits to an experience and an encounter of God in all these many ways that God presents himself and reveals himself to us. It's an important thing. Now, this is a heavy topic, and so I thought I'd bring a little levity. Um, I found this cartoon. That's pretty good, right? <laughs> Moses at the top of Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments, and he says to God, these laws are plenty complicated for now. Can we just set that Trinity stuff aside for a minute? <laughs> And as much as any of us might like to set the Trinity aside for a lot of minutes, because it's hard to grapple with, hard to understand, hard to find a good metaphor for, and all those things, a better thing to do, I believe, is to actually hold on to the idea that God is triune and embrace that, as we said, and thank God for all that we learn about God because we understand God as triune. So, if God were to, if somebody were to ask you, what do you most love about God, what would your answer be? What do you most love about God? Now, this one should be a lot easier than before. So what do you most love about God? That he's all about love. That he's all about love. Yes, Miss Dixie. Yes. Grace. Grace. The unmerited favor of God. What else do you love about God? Shoulder 
shoulder to cry on, hand to hold, shoulder to lean on, crutch when you need strength, help to get along the path. What else do you love about God? Why do you worship God? Why is God so important in your life? Courage. Gives you courage, yeah. Because we have to face some really hard things in this life. And a lot of times we're very frightened of what we have to face. And God, if we pray to God, God can supernaturally, by his spirit inside of us, give us courage. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, love. love. You bet. She even gave me the sign. Love. I love that God is forgiving. I love that God is merciful. I love that God is compassionate. I love that God is love. I love that God is a model for us for how to love, an encourager of us to love. I love that God is a God of second chances, no matter who we are, where we've been, and what we've done, and what we're going to do. God is always going to be there to give us that second chance to say, I love you, and I will wipe the slate clean, and I will give you a second chance. I love that God is a redeemer. I love that God is a restorer. I love God because God is transforming my life every day and your life every day. I love that God is passionate about his children and all of creation. And I love about God that God feels. God feels our pain, feels our joy. Not feels F-I-L-L, but F-E-E-L. I, I love that God feels our pain, our joy, our fears our worries and comes alongside us when we long for things when we hope for things god's always there these are all certainly good things to love about god but what i want to say to you this morning is it is also a good thing to love about god that god is triune it is not something to be afraid of not something to cast aside it's something good to love about god that god is triune because we learn so much about who god is and how god works in our world and in our lives that we understand God as triune. I love that God is triune because that tells me that God is personal. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches us that God has personhood. Our Christian concept and understanding of God isn't that God is disconnected. It isn't that God is impersonal. It isn't that God is distant. It isn't that God is stoic and quiet and just starts creation and lets creation do what your ever creation wants to do. That is not our understanding of God. The Trinity teaches us that God has personhood and God is personal. God can be understood as father, mother, sister, brother, friend, comforter, neighbor. Right? God can be understood as the one who became flesh and gave up glory so that we could see him, touch him, be touched by him, watch him, learn from him, hear him. Right? There is personhood in the triune God. And God understand the spirit means that God is present with us at all times. No matter where we are, there is a person right beside us. In seminary, they would fuss at you, fuss at you, fuss at you if you recall the spirit of God, it. Because the spirit of God has personhood. He is the person next to me at all times, filling me at all times, restoring me at all times, shaping and molding me at all times. I know all of this about God because I understand God is triune. And that's a beautiful thing. I also love that God is triune because it teaches me that God is relational. Though I do understand God to be one, I also understand God to be three persons. Three persons who are in constant and eternal and equal and loving relationship with one another. And that teaches me that I ought to be striving to be relational. Their relationship is in perfect harmony at all times, right? And we should strive for relationships that are in harmony and that add life. The relational nature of the triune God, the fact that there exists this perfect relationship between the persons of the Trinity, sets this example for creation and humanity that we're called to give life, called to be in life giving relationship with one another. And think about how different you would be if you didn't have the relationships that you have in life that give you life, the people that encourage you, sustain you, support you, people that um, 
maybe provide admonition in your life or challenge you about ways that you're living that are outside the God or the will of God. All of those things come out of our relationships, and we see God as relational, and it teaches us that in order for us to develop our God-given potential to become all that God created us to be, we have to live in life-giving relationships. That's another thing I love about considering how God is triune. And another thing that I learned about God, knowing that God is triune, is that God is diverse. Though they are one, they are three distinct personhoods, right? The Holy Spirit acts in ways in our lives. The Son acts in ways in our lives. God the Father works in ways in our lives. And all of this. All of this teaches us that there is diversity in the Godhead and that we have to appreciate the diversity of creation, the diversity in each of us, in our spiritual gifts, all of them. Thankfully, the person of the triune God are not all the same, and their diversity beckons us to appreciate diversity. I also love that God is triune because it teaches us that God is one, unified. God is three, but God is ultimately one. Through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, though they may have different roles to play, uh, when one person is active, when one personhood of the Trinity is active in our lives, they're all there. Right? It's not like just the Spirit is condemning us or speaking that little voice in our head and saying, you shouldn't be doing that. That's not really the will of God. When the Spirit of God is active in our lives, God the Father and God the Son are active in our lives as well because they are unified. Just like the Father alone doesn't create, and just like the Son alone doesn't redeem, and just like the Spirit alone doesn't empower and sin. <laughs> Over that. <laughs> when we say God is with us, we usually think Emmanuel. See, Emmanuel means God is with us. But God is with us in all three persons all the time. They are one. So let me close with this question. Why should we even bother trying to understand the doctrine of the Trinity? Why is it helpful for us to contemplate, think deeply about, parse out the Trinity, the, the triune nature of God? If it's so hard to understand, why don't we just think in monotheistic terms, why do we even bother with the Trinity? And I would say... That because if we even begin to try to understand and even begin to comprehend and even begin to try to know deeply who God is and God's trying in nature, then that impacts who we are. The more we think about, the more we contemplate, the more deeply we dive into knowing who God is, when we know something, it becomes a part of us. When we know something, it enters our being. And when we know something, when we know someone, we begin to be transformed by it. Someone. The more we plunge into the depths of the mystery of the Trinity, the more, the more the divine life will come to reside in us, and the more we will be transformed into the likeness of the divine life. And that is what we're supposed to be working toward. And so that's all kind of heavy. Trinity Sunday tends to be heavy, so I want to leave, leave us this afternoon, this morning, with two more cartoons. And I'm going to read these to you because I don't know if you're going to appreciate what they say. One is Jesus at a coffee shop, and the sign says, one free coffee per person. And he says, so I guess I'll take three free coffees, <laughs> which is just great. But this other one is two kids walking along, and one says to the other, Dad took so long trying to explain the Trinity. I didn't even have the heart to ask you about the Electoral College. <laughs> That's just great. I tried to find jokes about the Trinity to end with. Those are hard to find. But there were a few good cartoons, and I posted that coffee one on my Facebook because I love that. The Christian doctrine of the Holy Trinity is indeed a complex one, but it is a Christian doctrine of belief that is essential to our faith and enhances our faith and makes us better followers of Christ. Because as I said, the more we know about God, the more God's divine life. It is a doctrine of the Christian faith that adds value and meaning to our lives. So let us ever adore, ever worship, and ever embrace our triune God. Amen? Amen. See, Trinity Sunday's not so bad. Let's pray.
Gracious Lord, we thank you for your triune nature, for how you touch our lives in all these many ways, through your fatherhood, through your sonship, through your Holy Spirit's work. We thank you so much, Lord, that you love us so deeply. That you're willing to be all of these things in our lives. And touch us and shape us and mold us in all of these ways. Ultimately, Lord, we just want to believe in you. And to believe that you love us. And to believe that you need us. And to believe that we can be used by you. And that our lives can bring you glory. And that our lives can be a part of your overall plan to transform this whole creation. And so, Lord, in all your many ways to reach out to us, through your fatherhood of us, through your sonship with us, and through your spirit, Lord, we ask you to touch us and make us and mold us and renew us, restore us, and empower us. As you alone can do, Lord. God, we love you. We are sorry for the many ways that we fall short of your grace. We love you. And we seek to be more like you, Lord. Help us to get there each and every day. More. We pray these things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
guide us and nurture us. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and may God's peace go with you. Amen. Amen.